Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. And welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Alexis, as usual, before I introduce today's guest, tell me something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America. I actually recently discovered um, the reproduction of the night costume, or night costume, people actually wore it, in 1445 to 1460. It's an Italian um, design, but I realized from a minute lesson that we did with one of our docents where those were designed for specific people in mind. So, like, if you had a night armor suit for you, you couldn't lend it to, like, your cousin because it's not going to fit right. Um, and if you tried to do that, you would probably be harmed in battle because it wouldn't cover you where you needed to be covered. Oh, that's very good to know. Um, uh, I've, I know a lot of people uh, come around the corner if they haven't been there yet and see the night. So you've been, how long have you been here at Discovery Park now, Alexis? It's been about a full year, docent and social media manager wise. And so how long, have, what, since when did, what was, when did you start being the social media person? I came in um, in August, the end of August to be the social media person. So how's it going? It's going well, lots of learning curves, but I'm having fun learning everything. Uh, what is something that has surprised you, something you didn't expect? Um, I think I'm really learning about how as many times as we say something to our audiences, whether it's on Facebook or it's docents to a guest, every time we say it, even though we've said it loads of times, it could very well be the first time that a guest or someone on our Facebook is hearing the information. Um, so I'm really learning patience. That's good. Yeah. And for anybody listening who uh, follows us on uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, they might see Alexis from time to time. They're definitely seeing her work. But also one thing that's really uh, taken a leap since Alexis got here is our TikTok. Uh, what is our TikTok handle? Alexis? We are Discovery Park UC. There you go. And so everybody following, you'll really see Alexis's fantastic work <laughs> if you do that. So um, good job so far, Alexis. Thanks. Our guest today um, is Jason Pate. Jason is an educator, a youth minister. I would call him a historian. I don't know if he calls himself that. And author of the recently published The Journey of a Plowboy, the C.W. Hubert story. And we're going to find out a little bit more about that as well as more about Jason. Welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here um, and share a little bit more about Hubbard's story and also uh, the 33rd Tennessee, who was, until this moment, pretty much unknown of uh, many of the times for our local soldiers. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can't wait to, to dive into that. Back us up a little bit. Tell us about you. Where where did you come from? Um, how long have you been here? Uh, and you've had, a, obviously, an interesting path. So tell us a little bit more about you. So I was born and raised in Union City, graduated in 2006 from Union City High School, and then from there went on to Williams Baptist College in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, uh, to get my undergrad. And there I met my wife, uh, ended up having two kids, and my wife is a, a mental health therapist, well, was a mental health therapist. She's uh, no longer working in the field. And at one point, there came an opportunity for us to move back home. And so she went to work for Youth Villages, and we came home, and I was able to start pastoring and youth pastoring, pastored in Lake County for about three years, and um, ended up te substitute teaching at the Bryan County Schools, fell in love with it. It was the last thing that I thought I would do was teach, and substitute teaching, and then one day was offered the ability to go back to school and get a teaching license, and took advantage of it, and taught in Lake County for a couple of years and then came back to Abayan County. And I've been here now for year four, year five, and have loved every minute of it. What's, what is surprising you? You, you didn't anticipate going this route, but what are the surprises that you've encountered along the way that make you love it so much? I think it's like 
I was involved in youth ministry for years and still am at Woodland Mills. But as a youth pastor, you know, you're with that kid a couple hours every week, max, the average kid. When you're involved in the school system, you're with the same kid eight hours every day. I'm with my students more than I am my own child sometimes. And so the amount of relationship building that you have and the amount of impact that you have, I never understood the depth of it until I got into the public school system and realized the influence that as teachers that we have over our students. As a, a youth minister, uh, you probably can relate to Alexis. She uh, was a camp counselor. Have you ever been, have you ever worked in your church's youth ministry, Alexis? Uh, I did Young Life when I was a college student, which is a high school uh, non-denominational youth ministry. So I, I guess it's kind of similar. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And then you just, we ha we actually had to wait for you to come to Discovery Park because you were camp counselor. Um, where where were you camp counselor? Yes. Somewhere up north. Yep, Pennsylvania. So I'm. Um, so you can. She Alexis can relate to what to what you're saying. Yeah. I can see her shaking her head. <laughs> um, now, what subject do you teach? I am seventh and eighth grade history. So seventh grade history is world history. We look at uh, East Asia, the Middle East, West Africa, the Americas, Europe. Eighth grade, we start at U.S. history. We begin at Jamestown and we end at Reconstruction. So I teach all that every day. I have always said that that if I weren't doing this, that's what I would love to teach that grade and history. Um, talk to me about history. So when you were in high school, were you as passionate about history as you eventually became? No, not at all. Um, I liked history because I had a good memory. And so I could memorize a bunch of things and then do really well on the test. Uh, but I wasn't passionate about it. And I wasn't passionate about history till probably about – about six, seven years ago, um, my wife, who was a mental health therapist, I mentioned her earlier, um, she got diagnosed with schizophrenia and a very severe case. Uh, in fact, uh, ended up, she lost her ability to be coherent and the police found her in the middle of the field. Mm. Um, she didn't know who I was. She didn't know who she was. She didn't really even have the ability to speak. And very severe case of schizophrenia. And so I am really, those people, when we're dealing with mental illness and you're a caregiver for mentally ill people, you go through a series of grieving. And it's almost like you're watching the person that you know die out and you're watching a new person emerge. And around that time frame, um, I was working with a lady, a lady called Paula Webb. And Paula was an educator in O'Brien County for over 40 years and she had just recently lost her husband, Ronnie. And so we're sitting there working together. I'm supposed to be teaching. We're working together every day and I'm watching her grieve over the loss of her husband. And she's using history as a way of doing that. She's processing her own grief through the history, through the grief of other people. And so she's looking at me going, Hey, do you know the story? it actually applies to your life. And I'm like, no, I don't know that story. And if you know Paula, uh, you're probably smiling because you know that she's about to tell you the entire story about three times. Um, mm -hmm. And she taught me how to process grief through the grief of other people who previously lived. Mm. And so while Melissa is going in and out of mental hospitals, while she's kind of going through these treatments, which we still kind of go through today, uh, at times, she taught me how to process my life through the life of other people. And then I realized history is more than a, just a series of facts. History is a way that I process myself as I live currently. And as time passed, I realized, well, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to help people by retelling the stories of those people who are forgotten and making sure that we don't make the same mistakes or for if it's not a mistake, situation like life illness for us, how do I process it? Because a lot of times there is no answer to that. And so I wanted to dedicate my life to doing that. And that's what I've been doing now for the last few years. 
So I want to I want to uh, take off on the path talking about history, but I don't want to pass up the opportunity to learn a little bit from you about schizophrenia for anybody who's listening. Um, I know there must be treatments now, and and to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about it. So, um, you know, people who have schizophrenia, like your wife does, you know, is there treatment? And you know, what what is the uh, outcome, the the uh, process that you have to go through now? So there's no cure. Uh, for schizophrenia, there there is treatment. Uh, treatment is something we try to keep at a baseline. So for those who don't know, schizophrenia, I guess, is just where she becomes detached from reality. And everyone detaches differently. So there's no, I know like people watch Criminal Minds or they watch these other shows and they think they have an understanding. It's mostly just a detachment from reality. For Melissa, she hears and sees things that aren't real. These calls delusions in which in her mindset is life is different than what it actually is. So the treatment for her is intensive therapy when she goes to therapy in which she has to process with another human being what's actually occurring, what's real, what's not. And she's gotten really good at being able to train that. And then med- medication management, which is trying to keep her all those things that cause delusions away. And for the most part, you know, right now she's doing pretty well. Um, Melissa was the president of our college, our student government of our president, uh, was presenting at national um, level uh, for projects when she was 20 years old, award winning for psychology. Um, And then within 24 hours, all that was snapped away. Wow. Wow. And it's ironic that that's the field that psychology is the field that she was working in. Yeah. So she actually went from conducting a therapy session to being the patient in less than 12 hours. Wow. Uh, Very sudden onset, uh, very aggressive, very severe. And um, in fact, when she first got sick, we thought she had a brain tumor because, you know, we thought, but then you look at, you look it up and it's like, oh my gosh, she has to have a tumor. And there was when the doctor walked in and said, no, it's schizophrenia. Uh, we're going to have to send her to a hospital for a while. There's nothing that we can do for her here. It was really hard to process. Um, and so there was no resources that I found out there. In fact, I'm looking at writing a third book uh, here soon, just on that journey, because there is hardly any resources for people who have to walk that. And we know that one in four people will develop mental illness at some level by the time that they pass away. But yet the amount of resources that are available for those people from depression to anxiety, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive, that's their resources are very limited. Well, this is not really what the podcast is about, but um, I'm curious if you've got advice or suggestions for people out there who are the caregivers to people who are struggling with mental illness. Because I know a lot of times the person struggling with mental illness gets the focus of the attention. And so the caregiver sometimes, you know, doesn't get thought about as frequently. What are any tips or suggestions you want to share? I would say that the best thing that I did was I got myself into therapy. And I think a lot of times people think the therapy is for the person who's sick and which is true. They need to be in therapy, but as caregivers, you're also going to have to walk through a lot of the same feelings that they do in a different way. Uh, So I got myself into therapy. Um, Some of my pastoral friends called me and they're like, look, it's taking a toll on you. You've got to talk to someone and we want you to talk to someone that you don't know. That's completely objective. You know, like, just look, and so that's what we ended up doing. I ended up getting myself in therapy with a counselor out of, out of uh, North Carolina and got myself where I could talk to someone and don't shut down. You got to have it out and it's okay to not be Superman. It's okay to need help and to take help. That's what I would yeah, say. That's helpful. And what about your kids? Did you get them in therapy as well? Uh, Jackson's been my oldest. He's been in therapy. He's kind of, Reed was probably a baby, one to two years old, and they're real young during the, the worst of it. Uh, so there's a lot that he doesn't remember. My oldest still remembers quite a bit. Like he remembers waking up and not finding mom 
uh, Melissa had uh, written all over the house, like on the walls throughout the night as she was up. And he, he remembered seeing all of that and experiencing that. So uh, about a year or so ago, um, my wife and I started talking. And we were like, you know what? We're going to get him into therapy and let, let him process this. Um, and we were also really open with him. Like we didn't, we don't shadow that from him. Uh, when he was, you know, eight or nine years old, he could sit down and have a discussion with you on schizophrenia on a, like the chemical level of what it is. So like, you know, if, if you had a person who was sick with diabetes, you would sit down with that child and say, you know, mom's pancreas, you know, is not producing the amount of insulin that it needs to. That's why mom, you know, so if mom's give her some glucose, or, you would have that conversation and you wouldn't shy from it. We don't shy from the conversation with our children. We are very open so that they understand that it's not them if mom feels bad that day. And also help them process as well. And that's crucial if you have kids. So for you, history became kind of the lifeline that you uh, connected to and learned uh, to use um, to help you get through. What what was the big trigger? Uh, was there a moment at which you stumbled across something specific that sort of uh, made your endorphins go off? And yeah, it was it was civil. Just... It was civil war uh, specifically. So there was I just started getting an interest in images. Uh, which is what I collect still. We had the exhibit there, you know, at, at Discovery Park uh, with you guys back on the military days. And so I just started taking the image and I would look at the person and I would start saying, I wonder what their life was like. And so I ended just getting into it. And on the outside, on these images, everyone looks the same. But when you get into their story, that's when you realize you know, everyone's got something in their life. Everyone's got a skeleton and getting into those stories, lives, and then understanding, you know, uh, I got some of the letters to start doing letters. So I take these letters of these guys that are writing and their struggles or sometimes the wife's letters to their husband. And I got to process their grief. And it was just through the civil war because civil war is filled with grief. I mean, you're talking half a million people you know, struggling, a, a country that's broken in half politically. And, you know, that war became a way for me to process everything, especially Northwest Tennessee. And that's where I just kind of put my focus. So do you do any kind of research into your own uh, genealogy and those people that came before in your own family tree? Yeah. So I've actually gone and researched uh, the Pate family tree. I have us all the way back to the very first Pate was Thomas Pate who entered this country. Uh, and we took our children to the grave at um, Yorktown, Virginia uh, this last year. And got they got to take their pictures with the very first person who came into this country for them. And then we traced it all the way back to King Henry VIII's time frame, and, which was fun. Uh, and so that's one thing that we did. There was a lot of stories that, you know, we'd heard about our, our ancestors. We wanted to know if they were true and then taking our children to these grave sites or telling them the stories that we uncovered and found out that I had family. I didn't know, I uh, was able to reconnect with the cousin in Iowa who we didn't know that she existed. She was fun. She had looked for her family for years and was able to find us. And it was, it's been really neat doing that as well. Have you done the uh, Ancestry DNA? So I have it at the, I have it at the house, but I haven't, I got to like do the swab and send it off. And um, I've heard a lot of great things about that. And I'm excited to see what happens with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I've done it and it's fascinating. You know, you can connect with the other people that are in your family tree that are distant, but that also like genealogy. So, you know, it is an interesting uh, way to, to make connections, but, you know, just like anything else history related, it takes a ton of research to really find out the truth. You know, yeah. the people like you and I are very blessed now because we can go on the internet, we can look at yeah. newspapers.com, we can, we can find facts and details. Uh, whereas in the past you had to depend on a lot of word of mouth, you know? And yeah. so, you know, we're blessed. Alexis, have you done your uh, family tree? 
in your genealogy? I never have, but I've always been interested, and I feel like in the upcoming year, that's something that I'm probably going to try out. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i help you. You just Perfect. let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. I, I can help you with that. Um, so then um, I'm curious, you have a great collection, uh, Civil War photographs and, and memorabilia. What is your favorite item that you have collected? Ooh, that's a good question. So my, I, ha- I probably have two. One for rarity. I have a, an image of a Civil War musician in uniform which he is in Confederate, which is just a handful in the whole country. And I have been, that is probably out of rarity. That's probably my favorite, but the Hubbard letters have probably been like, they were on my Holy grail list. Like those are the ones I have a few Holy grail lists that I want before I die. Like I want that. I want this. I want that. Uh, and then I have some ones I'm looking for. And then I found a uh, picture of what I believe may be my distant cousin, who served with Nathan Bedford Forrest, and I have an image of him. And I was, he was uh, out of the McBrides, Martin Luther McBride. And so they moved over here from the uh, Middle Tennessee area. And so getting something of your own family is pretty cool. Yeah, no, and and honestly, the I've always loved the photos, and getting photos of my ancestors has always been a passion of mine as well. Um, so it is fun when you've been reading, you've been researching someone's facts, their birth certificate, their death certificate, their war records. But when you actually get a chance to look at their photograph and see what they look like, it really does bring bring history to life. Yeah. So when we get back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about the book that you just uh, referenced or the person, C.W. Hubert. We're going to find out more about him, what inspired you to to write the book, and we're going to find out uh, more about how you got it done because doing a book's not easy. So we'll find out more right after the break. West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off of I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who called West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner and the last home of the blues pioneer, Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are here with um, Jason Pate, who is an educator, youth minister, historian, and author of the recently published The Journey of a Plowboy, the C.W. Hubert story. So talk to us a little bit, Jason, about when you first met C.W. Hubert. So I met him first uh, in another book uh, by Rebel Forrester. Rebel Forrester wrote uh, Glory and Tears which is focused on Union City and O'Brien County from the years of 1861 to 65. And Forrester's book really focuses more on the 9th Tennessee Infantry. And in there, he had a picture of him. And I remember looking at that going saying, I will own that one day. Like It wasn't an issue of if I'm going to own it. It was before I died, that image, I will find it and I will own it. It will stay in O'Brien County. And he had one of the letters, uh, but it was transcribed, but it was actually, the transcription was not near perfect. It was still a few errors. And so I remember looking at it going, I'm going to own that. So I ended up making a few phone calls out to a lot of different collectors from Tennessee saying, who owns this? Because the family doesn't anymore that, that I knew of. And finally, um, it walked into my buddy's shop over in South Fulton over Jared Bellamy at Ken 10 Relics. And I had told Jared, I said, if it ever comes in your shop, you call me immediately. I don't care if I'm at work. I will immediately come and take off work. I'm going to get it. And he called me one day and said, you will not believe it. The image is in my shop. That's and I was, like, I was like, all right. He said, you really won't believe it. Like, 
you might need to like sit down, but along with it is all the letters that he wrote. And then he said, on top of that is the powder horn that was in his casket, like when he died. And I was like, hold it. I'm on my way. Like, let's figure out what's going to happen here. Long story short, end up buying the collection. And uh, I was not going to let it get broken up. And so I ended up getting all the letters. Um, there was a letter that was written pre-war about them going to sell um, slaves in Arkansas. I went and picked it up and we came in the collection and then had the powder flask. And I was like, okay, it's going to stay in Obion County. I knew at that moment it was safe and it was not going to leave. That was one of my goals. So um, who exactly was C.W. Hubert? So he was the son of the upcoming sheriff. His father fought in the uh, War of 1812 with Andrew Jackson. And he was a farmer, a very small scale farmer here in the area. And he had just married his wife, Betty. They had they were pregnant. Uh, at the beginning of the letters, she was about three months pregnant. And by the end of the letters, the baby will be born, uh, which they named Susan. And um, he was someone who loved Tennessee. He was someone who loved his wife dearly. And desperately, you could, as you read the letters, you can see he was a, a boy who, des- a man who desperately loved and wanted the love of his own father. And whatever it took to make his father happy. He was chasing the love of his own dad. And I've often wondered why that was. Was his father just someone not affectionate, you know, or why that was? But he desperately wants to be like his father. Uh, But just lived out here in the uh, area going toward the lake, I guess what we would call the crystal area. And this is where they're at. And he has this small farm and he's determined to live here and just raise his family. So for, for folks listening who've never actually uh, written uh, a biography like this, tell us a little bit about the process you went through. How do you start? What, what kind of things did you do to research? How do you fill in the holes? So one thing that really helped me at first was I went out to other historians who had researched this before me. Uh, John Ross, is uh, he lives in Clinton, Kentucky, and had studied the Columbus, Kentucky area with his entire life, he's now uh, uh, in a facility there living, but dedicated like 40 years of his life to studying Columbus, Kentucky, and was so willing to just throw research at me that he had dedicated his life to. Then we went through and we found every letter that we could from Columbus, Kentucky, written in the same time frame. I ended up buying some of them. Uh, researching, I uh, went to the Tennessee State Archives. They had a whole section of Tennessee 33rd, which I had no idea. Uh, it was just like archived in the back and went through it. Then how in the world the University of Indiana ended up with some 33rd Tennessee letters. I have no idea how they ended up up there. So ended up getting in contact with them and they are sending me stuff down here. Uh, meanwhile, I'm getting a hold of uh, see, the Tennessee State Archives. I have my stuff. Uh, we're pulling from other historians, and it's just like a collaboration of everybody pouring everything into this. And um, so all the letter, all the documents of the 33rd Tennessee, and when I say 33rd Tennessee, this is the weekly and Obion County boys. Uh, if you out of Callaway County up in Kentucky, all those documents prior to 1862 are non-existent. So August to everything to August 1862 was lost. Now, some records say they got lost. Some say they were burned in a fire. We don't know. But to August 1862, there is not a single military record on these boys. So what happened is everybody who died at Shiloh or everybody who died or got injured at Shiloh, there's no record of their existence. So, What I was able to do was then take uh, Ancestry.com and look at all the microfilm, go to the Bond County Public Library, who has a great 
resource section there, um, newspapers.com, going through all those websites and then just say, hey, who are these people that are mentioned in these letters? And let's recreate them. And then some of it was walking grave sites and finding graves that were way back in the tree lines and finding out who these guys were. It was kind of neat of a process. And if you're, if you're, I don't know if you have to be wired a certain way, but there's nothing quite like finding a missing piece of the puzzle yeah. when you're researching history and you come across a graveyard or a brick in the corner of a field or a newspaper article. Um, it's a thrill that is almost indescribable. Yeah. So uh, one of the guys um, who died at Shiloh, there's only one piece of paper that proves that he existed in history. Like, I do all the film. And the only reason that I was able to grab it and even make the connection as strong as I was is uh, CW's father, when he signed the death certificate for uh, CW, he also signs this other boy's death certificate as well. Hmm. And then I was like, oh, they died the same day. He's mentioned you know, in his letters, previous letters, these guys were close friends. And it was like, a, it was like Christmas morning for me, you know, it's just as a historian, when you look at those things, finding those connections, it's, it is like Christmas, you know, for a lot of us to get to retell these stories and find the pieces. Now, did you self-publish? I did self-publish. Uh, and that was a journey in itself. Um, so, highly recommend it i i actually got recommended by a cousin of mine who uh, is a minister and wanted to find ways to publish like his sermons and kind of keep a log of them and so he kind of turned me on to that process and they give you a template and then from the template you're able to plug in your stuff and then they have the process if you're willing to put the time in now, they don't do anything for you. They're not going to go on there. You can't call Amazon up and say, hey, can you fix this for me? That isn't going to happen. But if you're willing to put the time in and put the effort in, you can make it work um, easily. They also now are really pushing their Kindle uh, stuff really heavy. And so they have a Kindle app now. So when you want to make a Kindle book, they, it, it's just all automated. So if you want to make a physical book, it's about 10 times harder than the Kindle book. Kindle book is, it's easy peasy. But I uh, highly recommend Amazon uh, for what I did and what I'm continuing to do. And I, uh, I had called local publishers, called from other places. And then I realized, you know, this, I'm never going to sell a million books. I'm not going to be, you know, a million dollar, not New York Times bestseller, but that was not my goal. My goal was to take information and share it with my community. And for that purpose, Amazon was great. And what a lot of people might not realize is in the olden days, you know, in, in, in my lifetime, uh, you know, your options were you could go through a book agent and maybe sign with a big publisher and they would, you know, but that was few and far between yeah. the books that they would choose to publish. You know, you'd have to jump through a hundred hoops um, and then, or you could go to a self publisher, quote unquote, and you yourself could have, you know, 500 books printed. You could pay to have 500 books printed and then have them in your garage and have to go to book shows and, and whatever to sell them. So now through Amazon, doing it the way you did it, you can simply upload the file and they will sell the book on Amazon and you just get a check at the end of the month. So that's right. They don't print them, they don't print them unless somebody orders them. That's right. And then you're also able to do what's called author copy. So if I'm going to a show, uh, I'll order 40 books and they that takes a while. You may have to wait a month or two to get them in because they're not really going to put a priority on you selling books outside their website, you know, but they do allow you to do that. And that's another option that's available and it's still, you know, profitable. Yeah. The cost of the book can be, um, you know, four ninety nine or whatever, and then yep. you can sell it for 20 bucks, you know, and make a profit. 
Um, so I do think it's a it the the beauty of that is people like you who have done all this research, who have all this information to share and preserve for uh, the future. This is a great way to do that, and it puts the power of publishing in the hands of the actual people like us who who want to get this stuff out there. That's right. So, um, what happened to C. W. Hubert? What what was the end of of his story? So he ends up uh, getting sick. He ends up doing really well at the first part of Columbus, even though everyone around him in Columbus is horribly sick. Uh, looks like typhoid fever went through there. Pretty good measles goes through there. Uh, he gets to uh, Camp Tappan, which is Humboldt, and gets horribly sick. Uh, believes he's going to die. And from that point on, he's never the same. And he gets all the way to Shiloh, and he gets shot at Shiloh. He gets shot in the left hip and the left arm. He ends up crawling himself around the tree and waiting for the fire to go out. He gets shot around 2 o'clock, he assumes. He writes a letter right after, about a few days after this happens, uh, after he gains strength to his wife. And then he says he starts walking south which is, I guess, going back to a Corinth, which is where they came from. And he just continually passes out, passes out, regains consciousness, starts walking a few more yards, and from blood loss, just continually passes out until finally uh, someone gets a hold of him and gets him to the medical clinic down in Corinth. Um, down there, they do, I guess, the operation. His bone's not broken, so they don't have to amputate. They have to just keep him from getting, you know, infection. He writes a letter to Betty, uh, which is in the book, and tells her, hey, it's going to, you know, I think I'm going to be okay. And then a day or two later, he's dead. They, uh, his family in the area had come and visited him. They put him in his coffin. They had planned on moving him uh, to his the family grave site out here near Crystal Road area. Uh, Antioch area and uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest had come into the area and burned the bridges. And so instead of bringing him all the way out here to the crystal area, uh, he gets buried in reeves. And so inside the coffin was uh, the uh, powder flask that his father had given him and also a bouquet of flowers. And the bouquet of flowers stayed um, with the coffin. But when they, for some reason, they took the powder flask out of his coffin and they kept it within the family. And that's what I have currently. And that's how he's buried out there. If you're going toward Mount Pelia Road, uh, he's on the left going out toward Martin, leaving Reeves. So what about uh, Mrs. Hubert? My wife and I were talking the other day about how powerless and vulnerable women were, um, especially in that era in the South. You know, yeah. with, if they didn't remarry, they were in uh, dire straits. So how about her? What happened to her? So she ends up remarrying a man named Cal by the last name of Caldwell. And um, they end up uh, having a few kids. And um, they raise Susan, uh, which is CW and, and Betty's child. And she ends up having five grandkids. And so, um, Susan ends up marrying a war vet. And then at a very early age, she passes away. I mean, and so uh, Betty is stuck taking care of five grandkids. You know, she had a really rough life. I mean, she goes to the point where she loses her husband, the love of her life, and then raises as a, you know, as a single mom for a while till she remarries. And then her daughter dies and she's raising five grandkids. And so her life has been really interesting. I, um, so Right now, I'm finishing up my second book, and it's the it's the same story, but it's written in a narrative format. And whereas the first book is the letters, the history, the facts, the second book that lands in March uh, is the narrative format, and we take her eyes, and I write from her eyes as well. So about a third of the book is written through her vision of what it was like for a woman in this time frame to know that if her husband doesn't come back from war, what her life looks like 
what it was like to have the fear of being pregnant and your husband's in the military, which is something that women today still face. You know, if my husband's going off the battle, what if he doesn't come back and I'm a single mom? And so we took the time to really focus in on her voice and her mindset, the second book that's coming out. Yeah, well, I will look forward to getting that. I love this book, and I love that it's not just the letters, but it's also, you know, it uses the letters to sort of tell a little bit more about the history, and I really learned a lot from reading it, so thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm glad that you were able to get a book. I'm glad that we were able to spread a lot of information uh, about our area that's very rich in history, and sadly, a lot of our people don't realize how rich in history that we actually are here in Obion County. Oh, absolutely. We've actually got the little diorama um, up in the military gallery. Why don't you, because I don't want to miss the opportunity to have you here and not do it, uh, give us a little lesson about the battle that took place here in Obion County that that uh, took place during the Civil War. All right. So we have multiple sets. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit from a letter that I personally own. So um and give you a little bit of an insight that maybe not is well known. So the uh, before the first part of the war gets really big in Obion County, the Union gunboats were coming into Hickman, Kentucky at times and just causing havoc uh, through the area and mostly just causing panic. And so when the Union troops eventually do arrive, um, what they do is they kind of cause a diversion and they get everyone in the town square of Hickman, which is where their landing ground is. And they kind of distract them. And so that nobody would go and tell union city that they were there. So they're bringing union gunboats down and they're just shooting off into Hickman at times, just so that no one is wanting to leave. They're, they're going to stay at the heat of the battle. And meanwhile, they're sneaking off a group of cavalry to the side and so literally Union City had no idea what was happening simply because of the distraction that was happening at Hickman. And there are some records in which showed some of the women had shown up and with their bright red lipstick to watch the Union soldiers come into Hickman. And nobody thought, let's go to Union City. And the Union soldier, I mean, the Confederate soldiers at Union City are sitting there eating breakfast. And lo and behold, they look up, and here is these Union troops just coming after them. And they end up surrendering pretty quickly. Union City is going to be home to about, I think it's four small skirmishes before it's over with. Uh, one skirmish that happens in town is um, Nathan Bedford Forrest's men come into town, and they decide to paint a bunch of trees black, and they told the Union troops that they were cannons. <laughs> and they, uh, the Union troops, saying what they thought were a bunch of cannons, thought, man, we're all about to die. And they end up surrendering to a bunch of trees. <laughs> so That's awesome. Yeah. So and it, they had just got paid. And so all their pay for the last long, I think I paid in a bit. They had to give all their pay up and end up getting captured. It was the seventh Tennessee uh, CSA versus the seventh Tennessee USA right here in union city. They met, um, end up having a, an uncle who were fought there for the, for the union. And so we had a lot of different things. We had the one in which the distraction happened at Hickman in which they just completely surprised them. And then we had the other big one, which is when they planted, you know, painted the trees black and just completely fooled them and just gave up everything over a bunch of trees. Well, thank you. Thank you for your passion for these stories and for continuing to make sure the next generation is aware and knows. And there will be people that will follow us that will be equally as passionate. And I know they will appreciate yes. Uh, uh, you paying it forward. If somebody wants to buy your book, where should they go? So right, currently Amazon is where we have most of our stuff. Uh, it's twelve fifty right now. It is covered under Amazon Prime. So shipping is free if you're an Amazon Prime buyer. And currently we are in the process of ordering extra books to maybe land at Ken 10 Relics, 
Uh, over at South Fulton, that probably will not happen until about March, though. And then we discussed, you know, Discovery Part 2 maybe in the future. Um, but right now, Amazon is the number one way to go to. Two-day shipping, and you get it right to your door. Yeah, no, that's great. And we need to carry some of your books in our gift store, in our gift shop here at Discovery Park. So we'll make that happen with Jessica. I know she'll be um, anxious to do that. So um, hopefully in the new year, you'll be able to come here and and buy one of your books as well. Um, well, good luck with the one you're getting ready to work on. I know that's going to be exciting. And we'll have you back again uh, to talk about that one when you get it published. Sounds great. It'll be hopefully March 1st is the date that we're shooting for. So we're excited about that. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all you listeners who've joined um, all of us here today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your friends and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <music>